In any other week, the sentencing of Harvey Weinstein would have really dominated the news cycle for all of the day. But of course, we're facing a public health crisis. So while it did get coverage, uh, perhaps the discussion was not as much as we might have anticipated. Nevertheless, Erica Byfield is a reporter who I think can say heard as much testimony as the jurors. She was in court just about every day and right there for the end. So we were happy to invite her on to the Debrief podcast because we just kind of wanted to take a look back, both her coverage of it and just her own impressions of it. So Erica, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Is this your Debrief debut? Or? <laughs> it is, it is. Thank you for having me. Wow, okay. Well, we have, we have balloons later. <laughs> but no, uh, so much to talk about, but I think I will start at the end because you were actually in the courtroom uh, for this sentence, which was a culmination of so many things, uh, really a process that started in late, 2017 with news articles of, and such. Take me to the sentencing this past week. What you saw, what you heard when you looked over at jurors. G give us a sense. So the first thing that surprised me about the sentencing is we had heard prior to the sentencing, we were just going to only hear from two victims, Jessica Mann and Mimi Haley. But when we arrived at the courthouse, we were blown away to see all six women who testified during the trial walked in together along with Rosie Perez. So that was startling to begin with. Then we come in and everybody's wondering, well, what will Harvey, Harvey be wearing? Is he gonna be in his jail outfit? What will he be in? We see him, they wheel him in in a wheelchair and he's in a blue suit. And we also had a lot of anticipation because we were wondering if he was actually gonna to speak to us because during the trial, so many people wanted to hear from him and he didn't talk. Um, but we did get an inkling that he did want to say something that day. So there was a lot of anticipation in the room. Um, we finally got to the point after both ladies, Jessica Mann and Mimi Haley, uh, said what they wanted to say to Harvey Weinstein. In summary, both of them said that he essentially ruined their lives and they're trying to move forward. And then it became the moment where his defense team talked and then the judge asked him, Harvey, would you like to say anything? And he did. He spoke for maybe 10 minutes. I, I was trying to listen, mm -hmm. soft-spoken. Right. But it was the first time we had heard his voice when you'd heard so much about him for right. nearly a week of testimony, or excuse me, a month of testimony. It was fascinating. Um, he's a little more soft-spoken than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, based on what we've heard about him during the trial, you expected this kind of gruff. Gregarious yes, almost, yes. Big personality. Which at one time he was, I would imagine. Yeah. And maybe he's tamped it down a bit given what's going on. Um, but he talked about his children, he talked about how this has impacted his life, he went back to 2017, and he also closed it out by saying that he's a changed man, but it doesn't feel like the judge agreed. Mm. Just moments after that, the judge said, thank you for speaking to me, and then sentenced him to 23 years. Did he say something about due process and the, and the Me Too movement, or did I not? He did, he, he talked about how he questioned what's going on in America right now. He felt like there's thousands of men who are now in the same position that he's in because of what is going on. He didn't dive completely into it, so right. we do know that he was talking about it on a surface level. He spent most of his time talking about his children and how much he misses them mm -hmm. and how he fears now that he may never see them again. Wow, well, uh, certainly uh, a pivotal moment, many agree, in the, in the so-called Me Too movement. Tell me about uh, going along in the trial. Uh, you would send us notes to the newsroom every day with detailed uh, assessments of the testimony. At times, it was very graphic. Uh, very emotional. Talk about those experiences and were you able to glance over at jurors and just kind of glean impressions during various aspects of the trial, kind of what stood out to you? We were able to do that. The jurors weren't very animated and you would think that given some of the details that came out, they would be. Mm -hmm. um, there was one instance in particular where they were pretty shocked, I would say, based on their facial expressions. That's when the prosecution passed around naked photos of Harvey Weinstein. Um, they seemed to be more animated when there were a couple of witnesses on the stand and they were talking about some of these graphic details, but maybe just because some of these witnesses are from New York, they were a little feisty <laughs> in their mm. responses. And so that's what elicited kind of a reaction um, from them. Right. It wasn't really the details, it was how they were relayed. Talk to me about the cross-examination of some of the witnesses, uh, Mimi Haley and, and Jessica Mann. Um, at one point, I think it was Jessica Mann where they had to take a break or was it because she was just so emotional about it. And Jessica Mann was an aspiring actress, right? Yes, she was a hairstylist who wanted to be an actress. She actually, for a while, cut Harvey Weinstein's hair. I didn't know that going into the trial. Harvey got her job working at a hotel cutting hair. Um, but during her cross-examination, Jessica probably had the messiest relationship, if you want to call it that, with Harvey Weinstein because it lasted several years. It started out with her saying she didn't want to be in a relationship with him. And then 
going to some kind of consensual relationship with him and then to the point where she says uh, he raped her. So taking all that into consideration, the defense uh, attorney, Donna Rotuno, was very aggressive when she was questioning Jessica Mann because she was questioning her credibility. Um, but what was interesting about that is that on the first day on the stand, when she was going through cross-examination. Jessica seemed very nervous and a little unsure of herself by the second day, because she was actually on the stand for three days, so this would actually be the third day. Right. Uh, the first day was with the prosecution asking her questions, so they're a little more friendly territory. Mm -hmm. uh, but the last day she was on the stand, she had kind of gotten herself together, and every question that was a hard, tough question that would have maybe made her cry the day before, she followed it up with, no, I understand what happened, what I said in those emails, but he was my rapist. Mm -hmm. He raped me on that day, and that's what matters. Have we heard much about jury deliberations? Have you followed up any jurors speak and what they, how they say it went? Yeah, a couple of jurors talked about how it was emotional in there. Uh, mm -hmm. We hadn't really heard that. I wanted to know if they reached their decision quickly. This was seven men, they, five women? Yes, yeah. um, which a lot of people yesterday uh, in the courtroom were discussing that. like going back to that fact that seven men mm -hmm. convicted him when yeah. many people thought maybe a lot of men might side with him. Right. Um, and we remember jury selection was kind of a contentious process for a while. The defense tried to move to have a lot of people remove, uh, stricken, right? Yes. And they also took issue with one juror in particular, Juror 11. She's an author mm. who was writing a book or is writing a book about um, men in aggressive situations. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about that. And, and so we'd asked at least one of the jurors, what about that girl, juror 11? You know, was she dominating the conversation? And they said, no, she was probably one of the most passive people in there. And they said that they decided to go by the facts. They looked at the various counts and pushed away the fluff that the defense was trying to throw in their face and paid attention to what these ladies said happened on these days in particular and decided from there whether they thought he was guilty or not. Annabelle Shiora was there uh, for sentencing as well, correct? She was. I was surprised to see her, but yeah, she was there. The jury could not agree, apparently, on the on the two most serious charges which involved her testimony, right? Predatory sexual assault. But you were there for her testimony? And yes. It was said to be very compelling. It, it was a longer time ago in the 90s, right? Just give us your thoughts on that. It was very compelling. It was 27 years ago. Um, the jurors did not really say what they thought about that, so we still don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but she was composed on the stand, and what kind of backed her up, or if we want to get into the details of her story, we can as well, but mm -hmm. what kind of backed up her story is when they brought out Rosie Perez, an actress that many of you may know, yeah. I've seen before, she's from New York. Right. Rosie told the exact same story. So in my mind, it, it was interesting that that was backed up, and Rosie said that Annabella told her that story once 27 years ago, and she remembered it all these years later. Mm -hmm. um, and we also found out through Rosie's testimony that Annabella was not the one who came forward and told her story originally to the New York, uh, the New Yorker. It was actually Rosie who had recommended that a friend reach out to her because Rosie knew that's why Annabella was kind of brought into this all together. So Annabella had kind of keeping, kept her secret for decades. Right. It was Rosie who put her out there. So, Erica, t give us your thoughts. Uh, he was facing anywhere from, I believe, 5 to 29 years or maybe nothing to 29 years, depending upon that. But uh, your thoughts as someone who is in the courtroom, again, just about as long as the court officers and the jurors um, and the attorneys, uh, when it was announced 23 years. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts and what was the other reaction in the courtroom? I was surprised by that. You were? I was very surprised by that. Um, many people thought going in, there was kind of talk in the hallway, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? A number of people said, he'll get 10 years. That seems pretty stiff. So when the judge said 20, I was typing, and I had to stop, and I listened. Is that right? And the judge then went on to say five years probation after that, and then he just kept going, and he said the next count, which is rape of the third, and he gave him three years. And I'm typing as fast as I could, and then we're waiting to hear what was going to happen next. And then the court officer, said, court officer said, courts dismiss. And that's just how it ended. Like that? Just like that. All this in this climax boom, and boom. Boom, 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 boom. Wow. That, so you could almost imagine being a little dazed. Yeah, Everyone, we were even like. Even reporters like, okay. Yeah. Uh, and Judge Burke, known to be a stern taskmaster, yes. correct? Yes, exactly. And that's why a lot of people thought he would go with 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but he went beyond that, wow. 23. And then finally, I guess I just want to ask you, uh, as a journalist, reporter covering something which is described as a pivotal moment in our society's time now, and we put the Me Too moment on it, but just 
the fall for grace for Harvey Weinstein and this moment and what we heard from advocates groups and women. Um, your thoughts on covering that? Your, this, is, this is a, you know, perhaps a history making trial for lack of better words. You know, I had to remind myself day in and day out. I'm sitting here watching history. It's kind of fascinating. I'm a history buff. So it really got to me that way as well. And then and I'm also paying attention to the fact that this is not over. Um, history is going to continue to go. I mean, I wonder what's going to happen next in Los Angeles. We heard rumors from other reporters there. The other thing you have to imagine, I wish I could set the scene for you about the courtroom. Um, there were 70 reporters who were allowed in each day, only 30 members of the public. During the sentencing, even less members of the public mm -hmm. because the DAs had so many people in there. So you can imagine this courtroom is packed and it's quiet because the only thing you can hear is people typing on their um, laptops. That was the only piece of equipment that was allowed in the courtroom. So we're sitting in there, we're all taking in this history, and then we're all talking amongst each other. And from the international reporters, we found out many of them think their home countries are going to bring charges against him as well. So I'm not going to name those countries yet, but mm -hmm. I'm waiting to see mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So it seems like LA is not the end. It may be some other countries outside of the United States where he could face charges as well. Wow. Erica Byfield, well, thank you for your coverage throughout. I mean, we, we got a detailed assessments from you. Sometimes we couldn't unread some of the stuff that you had to put in there, uh, but great coverage. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm your host, David Usher. We want to thank our production team, Jesse Edwards and Ben Berkowitz from the NBC New York Digital team. We came to you from our busy newsroom in case you heard some uh, ambient noise, <laughs> but we'll see you next time on The Debrief. Thank you for watching this video from NBC4 New York. You can subscribe by tapping the button below me. And on the left, you can see our latest updates, investigations, and digital exclusives. We'll see you next time.